If you're watching from home, our sanctuary is not very full, but it's filled with lots of love and joy. The sun is shining, and I think the all heaven is with us this morning. Our scripture reading comes from two places. The first is the continuation of our commandments. We are on Exodus 20 and verse 16. The ninth commandment is, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Our next scripture this morning is taken from Acts 5, verses 3 through 5. Acts 5, 3 through 5. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sorry, I started at verse 1, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. My day begins by checking my email. The first email I get is a daily quote from the Ellen White Estates. This is the quote I got this morning. Just in case you didn't think God has a great sense of humor. Here's the quote that began today. Those who realize their dependence upon God will feel they must be honest with their fellow men. Sounds like pretty good timing, seeing we're going to talk about truth or consequences. And this is kind of a continuation on the theme that I began to share last week. We looked that God created us as social creatures. Social order amongst us benefits from truthful speech. If you can't trust what somebody says to you, then social and economic chaos is going to ensue. In his limitless wisdom, God told us that we are to bear no false witness. And the specific details of that ninth commandment talk specifically about making testimony in a court. Because in a court, false witness can condemn an innocent man to death, kind of like what happened to Jesus. But we can transpose the fundamental principle of the Ninth Commandment to deal with all human forms of communication. So today we're going to take a look at the consequences of lying, and what you can do to make sure that doesn't happen in your life. So the consequences of lying, we could list several of them. I've chosen three. The first is it disgusts God. Figured we'd start at the top. When you lie, you disgust God. God forbids lying because it opposes his character. And if we call ourselves children of God, then our behavior should resemble our Father. And when we lie, we disgust Him. Find Proverbs chapter 12. I'll wait because I get yelled at for going too quickly. So go ahead and find Proverbs 12, and I'll wait. Tammy, do you have your Bible or your phone? All right. 
I tell Bill when he doesn't come, you revert back to your phone. I couldn't see. Proverbs chapter 12, look with me in verse starting in 19. Proverbs 12, verse 19. The truthful lips shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but counselors of peace have joy. No grave trouble will overtake the righteous, but the wicked shall be filled with evil. Then look at verse 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Verse 19, a description of the people who are truthful. Verse 20 describes them as peacemakers, kind of like those people that Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. And then in verse 22 is the kind of the crux of the issue, an abomination. Those who lie are an abomination to God. That word in Hebrew means nauseating and disgusting. So I've tried to think about how I can help you understand what nauseating and disgusting seem like. And the best illustration I came up with is I want you to visualize eating a piece of bread, a roll that's filled with maggots. Okay, that's nauseating and disgusting. Lying disgusts God because he is the father of lies. While his enemy, Satan, is the, I'm sorry, he's the father of truth. Satan is the father of lies. Like, wait a minute, I got ahead of myself again. Good guy, truth. Bad guy, lies. All right. When we tell the truth, we are acting like our heavenly father. When we tell lies, we are choosing to act like the devil, his adversary. So, when we lie, as Wilmer shared in his good children's story, we make a bad choice. He's loose. He's making a... Oh, no, he's caught. One of the little guys was making a run for it. But mom found him. When we choose to lie, we're making a bad choice. And the first consequence is it disgusts God. Lying is a serious thing. Find Proverbs chapter 6. That shouldn't take you too long. It's just a couple pages back. Proverbs chapter 6, land in verse 16. Proverbs 6, 16. There are six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and then the list continues in the following verses. God despises lies. He doesn't want his children to lie. When we do, it disgusts him. That's why he told us not to do it. The second consequence of our lying is it damages relationships. God made us social creatures. Therefore, we have relationships. Doesn't seem like a relationship based on lies and deceit will survive very long. We enjoy a great relationship with our Heavenly Father because He never lies. Everything He says is the truth. Therefore, the relationship we choose to have with Him is based on truth we know it's going to be just as he said. If you're familiar with the testimony, um, the Gospels, in them, Jesus says 75 times, I tell you the truth, or a variation, very verily, I tell you the truth. And he says it 75 times because in his day, just like in our day, people lied a lot. And he wanted those who were listening to him and those who would write it down to remember that he is telling the truth. An intimate relationship is based on truth. 
And those who have an intimate relationship with God can understand that he always tells the truth. Find Titus chapter 1. I was going to have Stephen play the Jeopardy theme song, but maybe not. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. Paul says in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, In hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. He cannot lie. He will not lie. Everything he says is true, and that's good because when we lie, we damage relationships. When we lie, we damage the relationship with the person to whom we lie, including our Savior. And the secret is, he knows you're lying because he already knows what's in your heart and in your brain. So when you lie to God, you damage your relationship with him. And when we lie with others, we damage our relationship with them. Those of you who are parents, young and old, will understand the next illustration. Children sometimes don't respond favorably to parents because the parents lie to them. And they know it. Next week, we'll take a vacation, the parents will say. No vacation ever shows up. I'll buy you that the next time we're in the store, the parent says. They never get the gift. If you don't stop doing that, next time I'm going to discipline you. And it never happens. Kids figure out real quickly when parents are lying. And the relationship is damaged. Unfulfilled promises made by a parent to a child damages that relationship, which is why our Heavenly Father never lies to us. Go back to Proverbs chapter 12. Land in verse 19. A truthful lip shall be established forever. You want to have a positive relationship with your child? You want to have a positive relationship with your spouse, a friend, a family member? Tell them the truth. It may not be pleasant for that moment, but they know you're telling them the truth. Truth will stand the test of time. Lies are exposed rather quickly and damage the relationship. We've seen that lying disgusts God, disgusts God, lying damages relationships. Finally, I want to touch on the fact that lying will doom your soul. If you want to go to heaven where Jesus, when Jesus comes again, I encourage you not to be a liar. The Bible clearly teaches that habitual, unrepentant liars won't go to heaven. Find Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, look at verse 8. Revelation 21, verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Concluding the list of people who will never get to heaven are those who habitually lie. Some of you are saying, yeah, but they're only little white lies. A guy named James E. Faust, or Faust maybe, who was an early 20th century theologian, observed, when you tell white lies, you eventually become colorblind. They start off 
But then you got to tell another one to cover that one and that one and that one. And pretty soon you're at the end of the list and they are really whoppers. The consequences of lying include disgusting God, damaging relationships, and dooming your soul. So let's think for a moment or three about the cure for lying. I told Greg while I was up here, I'm not used to preaching before 1130. He says, don't worry about it, take your time. I say, I only got four pages. <laughs> it's going to be a quick one. Cure for lying. Wilmer's children's story is exactly the rest of the sermon. I like how the Holy Spirit puts all the parts of the worship together. You have to choose to tell the truth. Oh, you want the rest of it. Okay. Three things you have to do to tell the truth in accordance with God's love. First off, you have to tell the truth completely. Half a truth is a whole lie. I have wormed my way out of more uncomfortable situations in my Air Force career by telling a half-truth than I care to count. It worked for the moment, but then I had to face the issue again tomorrow. It would have been easier if you just told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to begin with. <laughs> Lasting relationships are built on complete honesty. People who really love you will tell you the truth. Even if it isn't very enjoyable to hear. Those people who are trying to impress you will flatter you. And you know they're lying. Tell the truth completely. Find Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27, land in verse 6. Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, caused by telling you the truth, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. First part of the cure for lying is to choose to tell the whole truth. If you're like me, you're going to need some help. The Holy Spirit stands ready to come to your assistance. All you got to do is ask. The second part of the cure for lying is to tell the truth compassionately. Some people were smiling when I said tell the whole truth because they were envisioning being able to unload the truth on somebody. Okay, the pastor said, bam. Just doing what you said, pastor. When you tell the truth completely, you must also involve this adjective compassionately. This means never use the truth as a club to beat up the other person. How do I know if I'm being compassionate? That's easy. Ask yourself this question. Why am I telling the person the truth? So I feel better. You just failed the compassionate test. Compassioning, being compassionate means sharing the truth in a way that is beneficial, not for your ego, but for the other person. How many people know Apollo 13 well enough? If I use it as an illustration, you know what happened. Anybody not know what happened in Apollo 13? You understand Apollo 13? He goes, don't pick on me. Three astronauts, circle the earth, uh, moon, are coming back. They're going to make an entry into the atmosphere. I'm not a... Scientists, but those who know this have said for the space command module to make a successful landing, 
it must hit a slice of the atmosphere as thin as a sheet of paper if the earth was a basketball. This has to be precise. The command module was coming back light because it didn't have 800 pounds of moon rocks. So the engineers talked to a guy named Capcom, the guy who does all the communicating with the astronauts. And the engineer says, you got to tell them about this problem. It's the truth. Tell the whole truth. Capcom guy says, is there anything they can do about it? The engineer says, no. Then the Capcom says, I'm not telling them. Nothing they could do to change the situation. Telling them that truth just increases their anxiety, which is already pretty high because they think they're dying in the first place. Don't tell the truth unless it's for the good of the other person. If you tell the truth just to make yourself feel better, better you're failing the compassion test. Find Ephesians chapter 4. Marty's still here. Okay. This next line in my notes is just for Marty. You can listen if you want, but Marty will understand. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 is what I'm going to read to you. It's in the middle of one sentence comprised of 164 words that makes up seven verses in your Bible. This is Paul at his finest. It'll start in mid-thought, but you'll get the idea. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Speaking truth, not to beat up the other person, but because you love the other person is what Christ would do. And as we emulate him, we grow more like him. When telling the truth completely and compassionately, it's best to use what is called the sandwich approach. Find 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'm going to tell the truth completely. And I have deduced that telling the truth completely is the compassionate thing to do for the other person. So Ephesians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, tell me how to do that. Watch, stand fast in the truth, be brave, be strong, let all you do be done with love. The sandwich approach is a technique to make that happen. Piece of bread, whatever you have in your sandwich, another piece of bread. Compliment, issue, compliment. If you can't figure out what the two pieces of bread are in the sandwich, then you're probably not doing this compassionately. You're just doing it to get it off your chest and make yourself feel better. So the cure for lying is to choose to tell the truth. Step one, tell the complete truth. Half the truth is a whole lie. And as you tell the truth completely, you got to come up with some compassion. For some of us, that doesn't come easily. But we need to think of a compliment to set the stage, tell them what you need to tell them, and then give them another compliment at the other end. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. You can find something to compliment them about. Third part is to tell the truth carefully. If you're not careful about how you go about telling the truth, you can do irreparable harm to the relationship. There's tremendous power in words. Power can either be a helpful or a hurtful commodity. And it isn't just words. You all know how to look at somebody and get them to stop doing what they're doing. Well, let me rephrase that. 
any parent knows how to look at somebody and get them to stop doing what they're doing. You have to take time to carefully consider when and what to say if you're going to tell the truth carefully. Go back to Proverbs. This time we're in chapter 29. Twenty-nine, verse twenty. Proverbs twenty-nine, verse twenty. Do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. There are many times I wish I had remembered that verse before saying something. We shouldn't speak in haste about a situation, an issue, a fact involved in a relationship. To tell the truth carefully and not hastily, you must choose the right time. Timing is critical if you want the other person to hear and respond. Unless there's some physiological problem with your inner ear, Everyone will hear what you have to say. That doesn't mean they will listen to what you have to say. Hearing is a physiological process with some little bones in your inner ear sending some neuron activity to your brain. That happens. Even if you wear earplugs, that happens. But listening is a psychological process. Listening is when I choose to attend to what you're saying. You can talk blah, 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 and I don't pay attention at all because I'm not listening. I'm hearing. Again, any parent knows that a child can hear but not listen. If you want to increase the probability that you're going to communicate with the other person, that you're going to tell the truth truthfully and compassionately, then you better figure out the right time. And it's usually what's best for them, not what's best for you. Find Ecclesiastes, which is the next book from where you should be, just in case you got lost there. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Look at verse 7. A time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak. I like the fact the silent part came first. A wise, loving person takes time to think about not only what they're going to say to the other person, but they're going to wait for the best time, especially for the other person. You already know what's in your head. The key to success is communicating that and getting it into the head of the other person, which requires that only do they hear what you have to say, but they choose to listen to what you're offering. Timing is important. When we pray and wait for God to tell us when and what to say, God will answer that prayer. Find Psalms chapter 5. King David is talking to us in Psalms chapter 5. Look at verse 3. King David says in Psalms 5 verse 3, My voice... You, God, shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In other words, I'm praying to you first thing. In the morning I will direct it, my voice, to you, and I will look up. He's not describing an attitude of prayer. I will look up is a phrase that means he will watch and wait for God to respond. We talk to God... He loves to hear us talk to him. And he will answer when we ask, help me communicate this truth to person X. 
help me with the words to say, how to build the right sandwich, and help open the door so I know when the right time to say this is. We shall bear no false witness. The cure for lying is to choose to tell the truth. Our human nature usually doesn't make that choice on its own. Our human nature is to default into inappropriate, sinful behavior. To tell the truth, you have to tell it completely. No half-truths, no white lies. You have to tell it compassionately. Being mindful of the other person's needs, not just your own. Thirdly, you have to communicate the truth carefully. Timing is critical if you want them to hear and respond to what you're offering. Always telling the truth confirms that you and I are a child of God, the Father of truth. We don't tell the truth to become a child of God. We tell the truth because we are a child of God. Find Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Paul says in Colossians 3, chapter 9, Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man and his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. You and I tell the truth because we already are saved. We already are a child of God. Therefore, telling the truth is now natural for a born-again believer. The old man is the person you used to be. The one with that sinful nature. The old man is the kind of person each of us was before being made new through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Find 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. There's that word, therefore, again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Being in Christ means you and I are on a journey into righteous living. We're going to live in a way that pleases our Heavenly Father. And the way we know that we're on the right path is when we incorporate the Ten Commandments, into how we live. Those are the principles of his character. They are the principles of his kingdom. And if we want to be a part of that, we can live that way through the help of the Holy Spirit. Thou shall not lie in word or in deed if, in fact, we are a true child of God. Closing song is number 121. Hymn number 121. Go tell it on the mountain.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that there is a whole holiday season that will help us focus on your love, your willingness to come and live amongst us, the sinful life, sinless life you led, and the fact that you went to Calvary to pay the penalty of our sins. Because of what you have done for us, may we be motivated to be your children and act in accordance with a way that would bring glory and honor to your name is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. 